I'm just excuse me I'm my name is Carol Minkiti I'm the wife of Ifania Minkiti who died several years th almost three years ago and myself and my children my four children have taken over the store because we want this wonderful place to succeed for a long long time <laughs> so I'm just welcoming you all here and I enjoy the wonderful reading that we have for tonight. So thank you for being here. And thank you on Zoom. Hi, my name is Fiona. I have the pleasure of welcoming and introducing the poets we'll be reading tonight. Kathleen Aguero's most recent book of poetry is World Happiness Index from Tiger Bark Books. Her other poetry collections include After That, Investigations, The Mystery of the Girl Sleuth, Daughter of, The Real Weather, and Thirsty Day. She has co-edited three volumes of multicultural literature for the University of Georgia Press. A Gift of Tongues, An Ear to the Ground, and Daily Fair, and is consulting poetry editor at Kenyon Review. She teaches in the Solstice Low Residency MFA program and in Changing Lives Through Literature, an alternative sentencing program. Kathleen has also conducted creative writing for caregivers workshops. Jennifer Martelli is the author of The Queen of Queens and My Tarantula, selected as 2019's must read by the Massachusetts Center for the, for the book and named as a finalist for the Housatonic Book Award. She is also the author of the chapbooks In the Year of Ferraro from Nix's Mate Press and Afterbird, winner of the Gray Book Press Open Reading. Her work has appeared in the Tahoma Literary Review, the Sycamore Review, Cream City Review, First Daily, Iron Horse Review, winner of the Photo Finish Contest poetry and elsewhere. Jennifer Martelli has twice received grants from the Massachusetts Cultural Society for her poetry. She's co-poetry editor for Mom Egg Review and co-curates the Italian American Writers Association reading series. You know, I guess I can take this off now. In school, whether things were by height or alphabetical order, I was always first. And so, Jan, I apologize. It's my habit <laughs> to go first. 
Um, thank you so much, James and Fiona, for inviting us. Thank you to the Minkiti family for keeping this wonderful institution alive. And thank you all for coming out on this rainy night. I think when Jan and I booked this reading, at least I imagined a beautiful day in May, you know, but hey, it's New England. Don't get your hopes up. Um, <laughs> And I just want to say how excited I am to be reading with Jen Martelli, who's a friend and whose writing I admire so much. Um, I just want to say, uh, take a moment to remember Louisa Solano. I've been coming to the Grolier since I was an undergraduate and when I was a graduate student in the BU Creative Writing Program. And when Gordon Carney owned it, Gordon was wonderful to start this shop, but you would come in and there would be all these white male poets sitting around and you didn't feel welcome. And he didn't like women's voices. I mean, the literal voices, not, I'm not talking figure of speech here. So when Louisa took over and made it a welcoming place for women, it was really, really fabulous. So um, I wanted to, I like to start with a poem by someone else. And I was trying to find a poem that would somehow speak to the assault on women's rights that's going on now. Um, I found this poem by Kashwir Nahid. She's a Pakistani poet. And I'm not trying to compare what's going on with the United States with women with what happens to women in Pakistan. But I really was taken by the spirit of resistance in this poem. We sinful women, Kashwir Nahid. It is we sinful women who are not awed by the grandeur of those who wear gowns, who don't sell our lives, who don't bow our heads, who don't fold our hands together. It is we sinful women, while those who sell the harvest of our bodies become exalted, become distinguished, become the just princes of the material world. It is we sinful women who come out raising the banner of truth, up against barricades of lies on the highways, who find stories of persecution piled on each threshold, who find that tongues which could speak have been severed. It is we sinful women. Now, even if the night gives chase, these eyes shall not be put out. For the wall which has been raised, don't insist now on raising it again. It is we sinful women who are not awed by the grandeur of those who wear gowns, who don't sell our bodies, who don't bow our heads, who don't fold our hands together. I should have said before I read the poem, I don't know what it's like in Urdu, but there, for the wall which has been raised is R-A-Z-E-D, don't insist on raising R-A-I-S-I-N-G it again. I meant to explain that, sorry. So tonight I'm gonna to read from my new book, World Happiness Index. And um, people always ask me this, so I finally looked it up. The, the title poem is World Happiness Index 2019. Okay, in 2019, the United States was the 19th happiness uh, country in the world. And people always wanna know which were the happiest. Finland, Denmark, and Norway were the three happiest countries. Belgium was 18, the US was 19, and 20 was the Czech Republic. In 2022, um, we've gone up a little bit. Finland, Denmark, and Switzerland. Switzerland and Norway always seem to be changing places are the three <laughs> happiest still, okay? Um, Canada's 15, we're 16, and what is number? Oh, 17 is, I can't read what I wrote. Oh, well. <laughs> I'll have to get a magnifying glass. Um, but I guess we went up anyway since 2019. The World Happiness Index 2019. How happy I am to live in the 19th happiest country in the world. <laughs> Tulips rose this month through the arsenic soil, and the air I breathe is dark with money. In country 19, we can say what we want. A professor in California is allowed to say we elected a racist president. And those who disagree can leave phone messages threatening his nine-year-old daughter because we live free or die. <laughs> Our children leave their houses each morning happy, not knowing what adventures the day holds. Might they be shot on the sidewalk by an officer who mistakes their cell phone for a gun? 
or by a stray bullet in the playground? Or will they get to school where they can hide in the closet from an active shooter? If they arrive home safely, there's always tomorrow and maybe tomorrow their teachers will have guns. They are happy to be living in this just happy enough country where no one dares get sick for fear of bankruptcy. If you try in happy country 19, you too can be rich as the sea. And if not, there are lots of street corners to live on and happy things to swallow or snort. And the fetid air from the subway grate will keep you warm at night if you knock someone else off it playing king of the mountain. We have problems, of course, that we're trying to solve, but we're from the country of hard work and initiative, of take what you want and say it was yours all along. Numbers one, two, and three with their orderly lives, their health care and housing and good schools for free grow soft and mushy. Not us. We're the ice inside a snowball, the rubber hose that leaves no mark. We dance on the head of uncertainty, cruelty's pin. Every morning, our sun rises, red, white, and blue. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Now I know I'm in Cambridge, back in Cambridge. <laughs> Fear Street. I lived on Main Street in a quiet city where citizens spoke kindly of those they didn't have to live with. But underneath every complacent surface is a set of fangs, sharp and growing sharper, hungry, irritable, insatiable. How suddenly it seemed to draw back its lips. I didn't see it coming. They said, that's because you didn't have to. It wasn't gnawing on you. How indignant I was on their behalf. How I loved my indignation. They rolled their eyes at my innocence, which was expensive and costing their lives. But I'd never hurt you, I said. We all live on Fear Street, they replied. But you couldn't read the sign. We're all being swallowed. Go ahead. If you don't believe us, walk into its maw. The rider, the horse. Fear saddled me, trained me, stabled me, named me, braided my hair, taught me to dance, taught me to rear, shod me and hobbled me, bred me and pastured me, cantered me, galloped me, spurred me and drove me out of the meadow. I'm sorry. Yeah, out of the meadow, into the thicket, out of the thicket, into the woods. Fear held the bridle, tightened the bit. Fear was the master, brutal and quick. But was I the horse? Was I the rider? This next poem, um, I wrote when my grandson, Emery, who's now four, was 16 months old. But actually, I had all three of my daughter's children in mind when I wrote it. At 16 months, brown and gold. My grandson plucks a marigold poking through a neighbor's white fence, crushes it between his fingers while I try to remember if it's poisonous. Three days later, he's alive. So I crossed the marigold off my list of potentially lethal flora toddlers might put in their mouths. So far, he has not harmed himself, poking out his eye by falling while carrying a stick, something my mother assured me would happen if I ever ran with a stick in my hand. <laughs> Though he tugs hard at the baby gate, he has not pulled it down. Though he has banged on the window, he has not shattered it, cut himself, or fall into the pavement two stories below. His skin has not turned from brown to blue during a tantrum, and he has grabbed the dog's whiskers without being bitten. He bulldozes his way. He prods and he pushes. He tries to put the whole of the dangerous world in his mouth while I follow, ready to snatch the worst away. When tired, he wobbles, he falls, he cries, but the next day he's walking again. Golden marigold petals stain his brown hand as he carries his stick. So far, no one thinks it's a gun.
Okay. I, over the years, I've been writing a series of self-portrait poems. Um, they might be done. They were fun. I don't know. I haven't written any more lately, but so they might be done. But anyway, there's a number in this book. Self-portrait is the two of swords. Again, for my birthday, you lay out the cards. By now, you know all the things I want to change, but don't. Each year, I get the two of swords, blindfolded woman, her back to the sea, crescent moon to the sky. And each year, you point out she could uncross her arms, drop those swords, unfold her blindfold, leave. I don't want to be her hoodwinked figure who can't tell she's free. But if change were easy, wouldn't you turn to look at the moon and the sea? She's perfectly balanced. What you can't see can't hurt her. Her hands always full will never be the devil's playthings. But don't her arms ache lifting those swords? What muscles she must have from raising them so long. You've moved to the next card while I nod as if I believe this time with your urging, I'll reach behind my head, untie that knot, become the woman of strength, hand on the lion's mouth without fear, or the star, graceful maiden, effortlessly pouring water from two pitches, pitchers, one foot in the pool, one knee on the earth. Portrait in Search of a Self. A vacant lot, a blank faced rubber doll that only speaks when baby pulls the cord. A mirror shines its light when people look, reflecting what it is they want to see. A hall of mirrors multiplies their dance, but what is it when no one is around? Great Zoltan shot, shut inside a square glass box will turn his head. Here, put a token in, pick up his phone, He'll let you know just what your future holds, then wait mechanical, immobile, and mute. A kettle still until you light the flame to make the water whistle for your tea. Then it subsides, a half-filled pot, a saucer left behind. Those of us from the North Shore remember that there still is a Zoltan at Salem Willows. <laughs> and you can put your money in and get your future, which is always sort of inscrutable, like a Chinese fortune cookie. Self-portrait as sunrise. Here I am, can-can girl, high kicking night out of the sky. Coral skirts, hot, think, hot pink feather boa, arms draped across that electric navy horizon. Dazzle dance, quick flirt, fade, and gather my skirts into that spiked circle children paint in the corner of their pictures. That thing you think you know. Um, so this next poem has an epigraph um, from a poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, which I, I often heard when I was a child, directed at me, but I didn't know it was Longfellow who had written it. <laughs> Better self. There was a little girl who had a little pearl <laughs> right in the middle of her forehead. When she was good, she was very good indeed, but when she was bad, she was horrid. <laughs> That's not at all like Hiawatha. <laughs> um, when I'm bored by some slow dinner story about to say, get to the point, my better self interrupts, please pass the peas, then tugs the choke collar. My better self makes excuses for me. I don't know what's got into her. She's not usually like this. Underneath it all, my better self wants to marry me, but she <laughs> thinks I'm not worthy. <laughs> She nicknames me Sweetie. I nickname her BS for better self. <laughs> when I want to bite like a black fly, she gets there first and blows kisses. Can't anyone see how awful she is? She says, you can come out now. Whoops, only joking. I snarl with a mouthful of maggots. She says, listen to me or you're on your own and everyone will know what you're really like. She says, don't talk back. Before we leave for the protest, my better self cuts her eyes at me. When you go to the rally, chant, pump your sign if you must, but don't pick anyone's pocket. When she turns her back, 
I slip her wallet out of her bag. <laughs> My better self insists we go to counseling. She wants to work things out. When the therapist asks, and how do you feel about that? I shrug while my bitter self sniffles and rubs her cheek. We're getting a divorce, I say, and I'm taking the car and leaving our issues unresolved because I don't want to prolong this any longer than yesterday. Meaning, I took the keys from the counter, the engine is running, have a nice life. <laughs> um, the next two poems I'd like to read are in memory of my father. His answer. I lean forward to keep up conversation as I watch my father make himself eat. At 96, he struggles to maintain his weight. 40 minutes for a tiny sandwich, a speck of a salad, then cake, ice cream, whipped cream, chocolate sauce. I can't taste anything, he tells me, only desserts. The sweet taste buds are the last to go. He's still ship shape, my father, the marine engineer. Every morning he showers, shaves, dresses himself. I used to be handy, he says. I went around and fixed things for everyone. Now it takes two people to help me in and out of the car. I don't want to be bedridden. And what can I say? The mouthy child who started this by asking what he looks forward to each day. Nothing, he shrugs. I've outlived myself. This is actually an ekphrastic poem that I started in a workshop Jen Martelli was teaching at the Salem Athenaeum. So thank you, Jen. Um, <laughs> after a painting by Quentin Oliver Jones. And the title of the painting, which even native Italian speakers have not been able to translate for me is Largo Dolcemente con Azorazama con Amalaleta. I am a stunned bird lost among pencil thin trees, a musical staff like a permeable fence stretched above, below, notes scattered in the landscape like Jack in the pulpits, notes I might sing if I were a bird with a song. The birches lean as though a small wind brushed by, but there is no wind, only quiet and one short flight stopped. I was once that girl asleep on the strong branch of the oak, a girl almost as long as the trunk of the tree where she rests as the limb where she dreams the same dream over and over and mistaking it for a life. Has she confused this passivity with serenity or sleep with enchantment? The moments we compose the least truthful of all, like the moments I composed for my father's death with his help. In August, he told me he wanted to die, which he did, and at home, where he did. In December, he urged me to wait until April to visit. We all knew there'd be no April, but didn't want him to know we knew. We were birds stopped, mid-flight, silenced. At the end, he was frightened, his constricted voice forcing out death, dying. Then he became the mute swan in the framed pastel painting, or perhaps the mauve bird in the stunted black tree with no leaves watching the girl asleep in the thick oak and the musical notes stuck here and there like stories we don't want to tell. In this sleeping girl's first dream, a child she adores is sucked down a drain pipe into the basement like a letter down a pneumatic tube. When she rushes below, she can't see or hear him. The plumber can't find him. Is he trapped in the wall? Is he deep in the earth? Might he be her father? In the next dream, her father returns. He didn't want to die after all, and being a man of ingenuity and discipline, willed himself back into the living room 20 years younger. And the child? He's right down the street, riding his bike with his friends, poking at a dead squirrel, then squealing and racing home. Perhaps that's the song she will choose. Let the rest of her notes fall away. And um, the last poem, Night Sky. Our troubles show up like stars disturbing the blank night, petty compared to the moon, jewel in a black velvet case, 
but grouped in constellations, what satisfying tales. The big and little dippers quench our thirst to be tragic as Callisto turned by Juno to a bear. Likewise, we've been wronged by a jealous lover's fear or like Andromeda, ruined by a parent's pride, then rescued just in time, or so we like to say to make our lives exciting, at least significant as stars we map our passage by, a story we can squint at, something with a shape. Thank you all very much. So tragic. <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you so much. Yeah. Right. <laughs> oh boy. Oh, it's so good to be here. Kathy, it was wonderful to hear your poems as always. And I love reading with you. And I'm thank you so much, James. And I'm just so glad we both had books coming out now. And uh, James, thank you so much. Um, and it's so good to be here at the Grolier. And um, I just, I, if I can just share a little bit about Louisa. Um, when I started grad school at Warren Wilson, I was living here in Cambridge um, over on Canard Street. And I'd come here for my 90 million books that they had us, you know, <laughs> buy each semester. <laughs> <laughs> so to write our annotations. Uh, and Louisa was so kind and she knew my name. And the first time she said my name, I figured I'd made it. You know what I mean? I, I felt, I almost wept. I'm like, did you say Jennifer? So, <laughs> um, so I was just, I don't know, this is just such a wonderful place and thank you for keeping it going. Um, so, uh, you know, I realized, um, I have a bunch of angry poems and that's what I'm going to read because I'm angry. Uh, <laughs> I just, you know, I, I was listening. I'm like, oh, I just, my playlist um, just is angry. And I'm, I'm going to start with a poem that actually isn't in my book, but it should be. If you ever, you know, have a poem, you say, oh, you know, I wish I'd written this two years ago. Um, but it just, it was, just came out today um, on Scoundrel Time. Uh, and speaking of ekphrastic poetry, which I don't usually write, I was in this little ekphrastic workshop and this poem responded to um, this Ruth Orkin uh, photo, uh, an American girl in Italy. And I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's, it's really, it's beautiful. It's black and white. You see this young girl, she's walking down this street in Florence and these men are leering at her. Uh, <laughs> and she's like, the woman, um, her name was Nina Lee Craig, but she had a pseudonym. Her name was Jinx Allen. So this is a letter to her. Um, anyway, letter written on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade on the cusp of its reversal, January 23rd, 2022, to the young woman in Ruth Orkins, an American girl in Italy. Dear Jinx Allen, I love the pseudonym you chose and wore like a rosary around your neck for protection. But those men on the sidewalk standing around the sewer medallions weren't under your spell. They fanned out like a major arcana spread on a table, your daily tarot. The old fool, the whistler, the leaning man, the Vespa rider, the man with a belt, the smoker. Were you walking in the shadow of St. Mary of the Flowers' massive red dome? In the silver film, the forget-me-nots, lilies and tangled vines in the metal basket nailed to the stone facade needed more light. Were you on the street in Florence that has my husband's name? Long ago, when I was there, I bought leather sandals too from a shop with my new name. They matched my dress cap sleeve like yours. Everyone knew I was an American. Are your leather sandals secure enough to let you walk by quickly? I'm writing to let you know I've read the minor arcana of your face. Two of black birds flying away, 
two of lidded eyes, three of clutch shawl, five of knuckles, one of widow's peak, queen of trembling chin. This is how I know you knew you weren't there, Beatrice. Today, because it's almost the Inferno's anniversary, my friend asked me for my favorite quote, our fate cannot be taken from us. Yet the cards we've been dealt can be reversed and reversed and reversed. Walk quickly, jinx, past the men watching you and out of the picture's frame. Thank you. So um, the Queen of Queens refers to Geraldine Ferraro. Um, this is how she was introduced by uh, then Governor Mario Cuomo um, as the Queen of Queens when she was uh, on the ticket uh, running as uh, the vice president. Um, Walter Mondale was running for president. They were massacred in the election in 1984. I think they lost every state except Minnesota or something like that. Um, so that was my second presidential election that I could vote in. Um, and I was so happy to vote for a ticket with a woman. And it was just shocking to me how many people just wouldn't vote for her um, because she was a woman. Um, women who said, you know, they, they couldn't vote for her. So anyway, um, this poem um, that I'm going to read is a sonnet. It's an American sonnet. Every line has 17 syllables, including the title, which is a direct quote from Geraldine Ferraro. Um, one of the reasons why people, I don't know, had a problem with her, besides just being a woman, <laughs> was that she didn't take her husband's name. She kept her maiden name. So. So this title has 17 syllables and it's by her. My father was an Italian man, so are my husband and my son. Sometimes when my stiff joints pop, women appear <clears throat> and want to talk to me. No matter how carefully I move, these women want to use their tongues. We all know that the dead can't speak, but some can shake rice in a tin sieve. A poet told me, the first tambourine was formed in Italian groves where women danced while cleaning rice and later where women conjured ghosts. I was ashamed to tell them I swapped my father's name for my husband's. The vowel so round at the end, they slipped into my smooth white sockets. No matter how far back I searched, the names were father's names, thick as guns. If I owned a gun, it would have a cool ghost white mother of pearl grip and an exposed silver toned barrel, silver back strap, slide and hammer. Its sound would sound more like air sucked out from small pink lungs or finger snaps. No matter how far back I traveled, Avellino, Salerno, Rome, all I found was a man's silver ax, his hammer, a boy, a blacksmith, no matter how I move now, women pop out of me. They sound like guns. It's funny, um, <clears throat> and I make reference to this in the, the first poem, when I was in Florence and my husband's family isn't from there. Everything was named Martelli. It was bizarre. <laughs> and then I said, that's not even my name. So. <laughs> um, so this next poem, I got the idea <clears throat> from an article I read in the New York Times. Um, and they said the words angina, hangnail, and anger all have a similar root. They all have the same root. And they think it's Germanic and it has something to do with like constriction, um, which was fascinating. I mean, I don't think I even knew hangnail was one word. I have to be honest with you. I'm like, wow, that's so interesting. Anyway. <laughs> root. I bought a new knife, sliced an onion through its skin, through its 16 layers. I was Sylvian and Plathian. I sliced close to the nail bed of my left wing finger, low to the lanula. 
This is the winter of hang nails and split nails. I spit nails, crescent moons fly out of my mouth and across the maple wood floor and little white knives of cartilage sprout still hinge to my skin, catch on my gray wool wrap. The root of anger is the kissing cousin of hangnail. Today, I learned that pearls without cores make the ideal sculpting medium if you were to sculpt skulls. The skins don't peel or crack. I can never wet again. The kissing cousin of anger is angina, a stab wound to my sacred heart, the one wound with wire. My grandma said if we swallowed seeds from a fruit, we'd grow that tree in our stomachs. If we swallowed the fingernails we chewed off, our tummies would be torn open by the claws we grew. Uh, so in the 80s, um, it, in 1984, I graduated from BU. So a lot of this was going on while I was there. I mean, it was just, um, I don't know, I guess it was an exciting time. I mean, I, I don't remember a good portion of it, but um, anyway. <laughs> which means I had a good time. I'm joking. Um, uh, when was my anger conceived? The summer of assassinations by the man-made lake, a hole so shallow and muddy, all the men held hands, formed a human net and walked toward each other to the center to feel for some kid who might've gone under there on its shore in the Kodak, me in my little terry cloth bikini, all round as the moon's stomach. I'd worn a Batman mask attached by a thin rubber band all summer my hands fisted, the nails bit crescents in my palms. The summer of my monarchy, against the lazy Susan in the kitchen, I stood watching the president resign on the small TV. I cried because of the cramps and blood, the garter belt biting me. My mother said, we'd never see this again, and she was wrong. Even married to my father, she couldn't predict the depth of a man's rage. The summer of my first abortion, the clinic three stops down from my dorm, three quick stops on the green line, and no one shot there yet, but escorts still needed, one pink set of rosaries flung at my face. That year, 1984, my aunt said she wouldn't vote for anything that menstruated, could get pregnant, could bear a child. Yeah, <laughs> that was the big thing. What if she got her period? We wouldn't want an emotional person. <laughs> wouldn't want that. <clears throat> so a lot of these poems uh, were written at the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, like in root, all, I remember, the thing I remember is just how dry my hands were all the time because I was washing them constantly. I was inside and I, like everything was catching and I went on a lot of walks. Um, so, you know, it's funny with this poem, I almost wish I could take it out of the book because the shop that I reference, um, I was walking by the other day and the owner had a big let's go Brandon sign in the window. I'm like, should I throw a rock? You know, anyway, so. uh, fugue. I choreographed the deep distance between me and the shadows. Twice in my life, ghost women manifested in my hinged joints, my elbow, the first knuckle of my left pointer finger, my jaw. They manifested in the cabinet where I keep chipped china in the tortoise, tortoiseshell cup I stole from my father's bureau. I didn't know how fragile everything was. Something like glass cracks, then silence. Then I stop under an overcast sky, heavy and low as a whale's belly full of gray pearls, the shadow of the gulls. Pleasant Street's black top split after the quick freeze. It is all but deserted. I wear my camel colored coat, walk down to the post office, past the purple croquis that broke through too soon, fooled by an early thaw. 
past the shop that repairs glass and displays panes and mirrors in its storefront window. The man inside measures and cuts smokes and waves to me. Storm doors, storm door frames lean on the facade. The gulls are bold and hungry now, flock blocks from the beach. Um, Kevin, here's a Revere poem. There we go. <laughs> this is really a hybrid piece. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's more prose than poetry. Uh, tongue root. I have always lived by the ocean. When I was a child, I built my altar at low tide on Revere Beach. I made a pentacle with a small suede fringe pouch I stole from one sister with my other sister's doll tucked inside. The blue plastic pirate sword I pulled from the heart of a maraschino cherry. Grandpa's skeleton key I found dangling from a hook on grandma's stove. From my mother's pocket, the book of matches from the General Edwards Inn. My father's tarnished brass tie pin with an embossed tiny white house. What I conjured then, I live with now. I conjured women nobody heard. I asked my friend who has the same name as I, do people think I'm not so bright? No one thinks that, she said, but you have a strong accent. <laughs> we don't, we don't. <laughs> long ago, everybody I knew had last names like mine, all ending with long rounded vowels. Vowels have heft. Like planets orbiting, they are frictionless, compulsive, and smooth. The vowel is the nucleus of a word Everything, all sound, depends on the position of the tongue root for articulation, for movement. Maybe people hear me and think I've never left this place. There are whole sounds I elide, delete, erase. There are whole periods of time too. There are people. What I mean is no one taught me to pronounce a whole phoneme, to roll my tongue, to open the glottis, to think that ghosts won't appear when I speak. Oh, thank you. Um, two more poems. So this next poem is, a, is a, an invented form invented by the brilliant Jericho Brown. Uh, it's called the duplex. And uh, not only is he brilliant, but he's generous because I emailed him and asked him how to write a duplex. And he sent me back a whole packet on how to write a duplex. <laughs> so, I mean, which was wonderful. I mean, he don't, we don't know each other or anything, but I just thought that was just so nice of him. So you'll hear the, the rhyme and everything. It's sort of a mix between a sonnet and the blues and a guzzle. So it's, it's harder than, like, it sounds like it should be really easy. It, it was harder for me to write it, but um, very satisfying. The year of Geraldine Ferraro duplex. Oh, uh, let me just back up. This first line, um, when Ferraro debated George H.W. Bush, um, she did really well. And some people, you know, would argue that she bested him and uh, which didn't go over well, you know, with, with that side. So this, the first line of this poem is a quote from her. The year of Geraldine Ferraro duplex. You can't make a man look that bad and live. <laughs> when I got sober, I was told to forgive. But how do I stay sober after I forgive? A brutal man gave me a gray pearl ring, broke his brutal teeth on my gray pearl ring. He wanted to eat me up so I'd disappear. He thought, he thought he'd eaten me all, but no, I didn't disappear. I sat in his boozy belly, all warm, red and pink, warm in my belly, my booze all sweet and pink. Would you rather feel anger than sadness? Would you rather feel angrily all of your sadnesses? How sweet must you be to be loved by God? How sweet is the silence in the belly of God? You can't make that man look bad and live. <laughs> And um, 
I'm going to end with a poem, um, and it has a um, an epigraph. The other uh, great fault of Geraldine Ferraro that uh, she was strongly pro-choice, um, and you know Roman Catholic, um, and that lost her 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 stand on abortion. I mean, there were many reasons why she wasn't supported, but this. Um, you know, the Italian American community didn't support her. She was pretty much, um, I don't know, I don't know, pushed out because of that. So um, this quote is, has been argued as to what she said, but it's the Catholic church is or is not monolithic in its teachings on abortion. Questions to the electorate. Is a man a monolith? Can you decorate a monolith with sprigs of nutmeg, rue, Penny Royal, a garden of abortifacients? Can you grow savin, squills, ergot of rye around the monolith? Can you dig down far enough so the roots will embed? Can I rule as a monolith? Can I rule as a woman who's had not one but two, two abortions and is still not sad? Can I rule as a woman who is not sad at all? Can we drape the monolith with pearls? chunky fake gems? Can we polish its flat dark marble surface until it shines like the tombstones in the cemetery? Will you circle the monolith? Will you join hands with me and dance and dance and dance? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Q &A. Oh, sure. Should I? Um, I have a question. Can you talk about how you two met each other? Oh, I, I don't know how to do this. I know. <laughs> Hi. Uh, you can sit or we can, you can stand. We met at Gulu Gulu. Right? Gulu Gulu. Um, <laughs> so Kathy and Richard moved up to the North Shore. How many years? Five. Five, Five years, years ago. ago. And we all just became like, the best of friends yeah uh, our, we have a great writing community up there i dare to say one of the best writing communities that's true you know um just it's very supportive and um yeah no it was so. wonderful there were the mass poetry festivals going on when we first moved there right. and i had new Kali because she had written a review for me and yeah. she said why don't you come and meet with everybody thursday morning at gulu gulu and it was mm -hmm. like an instant yeah entree and um yeah. i do have to say this about the north shore because i was absolutely impressed by this that everyone was welcome it didn't matter if you won an award great if mm -hmm. you were just starting yeah. great there yeah. was a great kind of democracy and inventiveness like colleen michael's poetry yeah. in improbable places so yeah. she'll hold it in a paint store and everybody has to have poems about color colors or a pirate ship and everybody yeah. else comes back. Yeah. So yeah, it was a, it's a very welcoming place. Right. Yeah. So are they just poets in this group? Mm -hmm. Pretty, well, yeah. Well, Kevin writes fiction too. Yeah. And so and does Richard, JD. And yeah. Richard. Um, so some people go outside. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Could I ask you a question about either of your collections? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you I don't know. When you do what I do, you pile up a bunch of calls and you go, I think I have a collection here. Or <laughs> did you stop writing thematically and fit the collection at some point? Did you, uh, you want to put it together? Well, some, I think there's only one book where I did it thematically, and that was Daughter of, which is one long thematic section. No, I do exactly what you do. And then suddenly, because they're all from my head, I decide they're connected. <laughs> <laughs> that's the connection you know in this case um like i didn't set out and say like i'm going to write a book of poetry about geraldine ferraro but i started i mean it, it really didn't start with the noblest idea you know i was just thinking of the 80s you know in the clothes <laughs> in the music and uh you know in what was going on then and uh so i started writing in in um I don't know, I want to say like it was 2019. And I remember thinking like, wow, all these same people are still here. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like in the 80s, I mean, you know, Donald Trump was who he was and, you know, just all mm -hmm. the same people we, were, were around. And um, so I just kind of started writing to that. And then 
then, you know, I mean, the, the pandemic happened and I was thinking of, you know, what happened with AIDS and, and how it was ignored, um, you know, and then Kamala Harris, you know, and other, you know, so it, in that way, the theme found me in a way, if that makes, does that answer your question? I mean, I can't say that happens with like every book. I haven't written a ton of them, but you know, and that's have the Kitty Genovese. Yeah, the Kitty, yeah, like my Tarantella, like that kind of started the same way though. Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking of clothes from the 60s. <laughs> 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 so does, you know, and, yeah. 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 Are there other women that you might consider I know as emblematic of various decades? Oh gosh. I mean I have you know, again, as I say, like I didn't start out look, you know, saying like, you know, let me think of a woman from this time or anything like that. Um I mean I'm sure there are, you know, obviously. Um but I don't know, you know, I, I, that isn't how I entered these books. So I, you know, um, like right now, this manuscript that I have is not about, you know, any one woman, or, you know, what's well, about me. <laughs> <laughs> every woman. Yeah, every woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so I was, I was your writing changed a lot from when you started out. And what was it like when you first started studying it? Um, Seriously, you know, in a university setting. Hmm. I, I think my writing has changed a lot. I, mm -hmm. I hope it's gotten better and more um, complicated and more. Well, the one thing that I went to Boston University for graduate school, and the one thing I did not take was a course on form. So at some point, mm -hmm. I thought, whether you write in form or not, you should know about it. And I worked my way all through this Mary Kinsey's book of poetry. And I think that hopefully influenced my writing. But I, I always wrote. Um, even if it was really terrible when I was a kid and I always wanted to be a writer. Mm. Um, so hopefully it's changed. I mean, I know my first book came out with Alice James in like 1973, 1976. Mm. And while I was walking on water, I thought lucky I didn't get hit by a car. I thought it was like, <laughs> <"Snow -hoo." laughs> now I know better. I mean, I'm always happy when I have a book, but I know it doesn't change anything too dramatically. <laughs> But that did make me feel amazing. Being part of that cooperative, yeah. and that wonderful group mm. of women was amazing. Right, right. I, you know, it's funny. I, I, I know that I went through this period when I really started writing and I was living here. And uh, it was great because, you know, Marie Howe would, you know, tape her workshop, you know, like on the, on the glass there, you know, $50, you know, mm. and Lucy Brock, you know, they were just amazing, you know, writers here. And, um, like I really wanted to be deep, you know what I mean? I, I <laughs> you know, like, oh, she's so spiritual. And so, you know, just, I, I really wanted to come off that way. And I had like no grounding for that. Like there was no truth to that really for me at that time, you know, and probably still. So um, I wanted, I hope that I've become more secure as a person that I can, you know, I can write about something that isn't deep. I, I don't, if that makes mm. any sense, you know, am yeah. I, am I making yeah. sense with that? Yes, that I can yes, be yes, honest yes. in a, in a plainer way. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. Jennifer, can you hear me? This is Barbara. Oh, no. Nope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know. Thank you for coming in now. Thank you all. I know.